The Price of Light by Ellis Peters Hamo Fitzhamon of Litigate held two fat manors in the northeastern corner of the county, towards the border of Cheshire. Though a gross feeder, a heavy drinker, a self-indulgent lecher, a harsh landlord, and a brutal master, he had reached the age of sixty in the best of health, and it came as a salutary shock to him when he was at last taken with a mild seizure, and for the first time in his life saw the next world yawning before him, and woke to the uneasy consciousness that it might see fit to treat him somewhat more austerely than this world had done. Though he repented none of them, he was aware of a whole register of acts in his past which heaven might construe as heavy sins. It began to seem to him a prudent precaution to acquire merit for his soul as quickly as possible, also as cheaply, for he was a grasping and possessive man, a judicious gift to some holy house should secure the welfare of his soul. There was no need to go so far as endowing an abbey or a new church of his own. The Benedictine Abbey of Shrewsbury could put up a powerful assault of prayers on his behalf in return for a much more modest gift. The thought of alms to the poor, however ostentatiously bestowed in the first place, did not recommend itself. Whatever was given would soon be consumed and forgotten, and a ragtag of beggarly blessings from the indigent could carry very little weight, besides failing to confer a lasting luster upon himself. No, he wanted something that would continue in daily use and daily respectful notice, a permanent reminder of his munificence and piety. He took his time about his decision, and when he was satisfied of the best value he could get for the least expenditure, he sent his lawmen to Shrewsbury to confer with Abbot and Prior, and conclude with due ceremony and many witnesses the charter that conveyed to the custodian of the altar of St. Mary within the Abbey Church, one of his free tenant farmers, the rent to provide light for Our Lady's altar throughout the year. He promised also for the proper displaying of his charity the gift of a pair of fine silver candlesticks, which he himself would bring and see installed on the altar at the coming Christmas feast. Abbot Harriban, who after a long life of repeated disillusionments still contrived to think the best of everybody, was moved to tears by this penitential generosity. Prior Robert, himself an aristocrat, refrained out of Norman solidarity from casting doubt upon Hamo's motive, but he elevated his eyebrows all the same. Brother Cadfile, who knew only the public reputation of the donor, and was skeptical enough to suspend judgment until he encountered the source, said nothing, and waited to observe and decide for himself. Not that he expected much. He had been in the world fifty-five years, and learned to temper all his expectations, bad or good. It was with mild and detached interest that he observed the arrival of the party from Lydiate on the morning of Christmas Eve, a hard, cold Christmas it was proving to be, that year of 1135, all bitter black frost and grudging snow, thin and sharp as whips before a withering east wind. The weather had been vicious all the year, and the harvest a disaster. In the villages people shivered and starved, and Brother Oswald, the almoner, fretted and grieved the more that the alms he had to distribute were not enough to keep all those bodies and souls together. The sight of a cavalcade of three good-riding horses, ridden by travelers richly wrapped up from the cold, and followed by two pack-ponies, brought all the wretched petitioners crowding and crying, holding out hands blue with frost. All they got out of it was a single perfunctory handful of small coin. When they hampered his movements, Fitzhammond used his whip as a matter of course to clear the way. Rumor, thought Brother Cadfile, pausing on his way to the infirmary with his daily medicines for the sick, had probably not done Hamo Fitzhammond any injustice. Dismounting in the great court, the knight of Lydiate was seen to be a big, overflushed, top-heavy man with bushy hair and beard and eyebrows, all gray-streaked from their former black, and stiff and bristling as wire. 
He might well have been a very handsome man before indulgence purpled his face and pocked his skin and sank his sharp black eyes deep into flabby sacks of flesh. He looked more than his age, but still a man to be reckoned with. The second horse carried his lady, pillion behind a groom. A small figure she made, even swathed almost to invisibility in her woolens and furs, and she rode smuggled comfortably against the groom's broad back, her arms hugging him round the waist. And a very well-looking young fellow he was, this groom, a strapping lad barely twenty years old, with round, ruddy cheeks and merry, guileless eyes, long in the legs, wide in the shoulders, everything a country youth should be, and attentive to his duties into the bargain, for he was down from the saddle in one lithe leap, and reaching up to take the lady by the waist, every bit as heartily as she had been clasping him a moment before, and lift her lightly down. Small gloved hands rested on his shoulders a brief moment longer than was necessary. His respectful support of her continued until she was safe on the ground and sure of her footing. Perhaps a few seconds more. Hamo Fitzhammond was occupied with Prior Robert's ceremonious welcome and the attentions of the hospitaller who had made the best rooms of the guest hall ready for him. The third horse also carried two people, but the woman on the pillion did not wait for anyone to help her down, but slid quickly to the ground, and hurried to help her mistress off with a great outer cloak in which she had travelled, a quiet, submissive young woman, perhaps in her middle twenties, perhaps older, in drab homespun, her hair hidden away under a coarse linen wimple. Her face was thin and pale, her skin dazzlingly fair, and her eyes, reserved and weary, were of a pale clear blue, a fierce color that ill suited their humility and resignation. Lifting the heavy folds from her lady's shoulders, the maid showed a head the taller of the two, but drab indeed beside the bright little bird that emerged from the cloak. Lady Fitzhammond came forth graciously, smiling on the world in scarlet and brown, like a robin, and just as confidently. She had dark hair braided about a small, shapely head, soft, full cheeks, flushed rosy by the chill air, and large, dark eyes assured of their charm and power. She could not possibly have been more than thirty, probably not so much. Fitzhammond had a grown son somewhere with children of his own, and waiting, some said with little patience, for his inheritance. This girl must be a second or a third wife, a good deal younger than her stepson, and a beauty at that. Hamo was secure enough and important enough to keep himself supplied with wives as he wore them out. This one must have cost him dear, for she had not the air of a poor but pretty relative, sold for a profitable alliance. Rather, she looked as if she knew her own status, very well indeed, and meant to have it acknowledged. She would do well presiding over the high table at Lydiat, certainly which was probably the main consideration. The groom behind whom the maid had ridden was an older man, lean and wiry, with a face like the bowl of a knotty oak. By the sardonic patience of his eyes he had been in close and relatively favorite attendance on Fitzhammond for many years, knew the best and the worst his moods could do, and was sure of his own ability to ride the storms. Without a word he set about unloading the pack-horses and followed his lord to the guest-house, while the young man took Fitzhammond's bridle and led the horses away to the stables. Cadfile watched the two women cross to the doorway, the lady springy as a young hind, with bright eyes taking in everything around her, the tall maid keeping always a pace behind, with long steps curved to keep her distance. Even thus frustrated like a mute hawk, she had a graceful gait, almost certainly of Elaine stock, like the two grooms. Cadfile had long practice in distinguishing the free from the unfree, not that the free had any easy life. Often they were worse off than the villains of their neighborhood. There were plenty of freemen, this Christmas, gaunt and hungry, forced to hold out begging hands among the throng round the gatehouse. Freedom, the first ambition of every man, still could not fill the bellies of wives and children in a bad season. Fitzhammond and his party appeared at Vespers in full glory to see the candlesticks reverently installed upon the altar in the Lady Chapel, 
Abbot, Prior, and brothers had no difficulty in sufficiently admiring the gift. For they were indeed things of beauty, two fluted stems ending in the twin cups of flowering lilies. Even the veins of the leaves showed delicate and perfect as in the living plant. Brother Oswald, the almoner, himself a skilled silversmith when he had time to exercise his craft, stood gazing at the new embellishments of the altar with a face and mind curiously torn between rapture and regret, and ventured to delay the donor for a moment, as he was being ushered away to sup with Abbot Herobert in his lodgings. My lord, these are truly of noble workmanship. I have some knowledge of precious metals, and of the most notable craftsmen in these parts, but I never saw any work so true to the plant as this. A countryman's eye is here, but the hand of a court craftsman. May we know who made them? Fitzhammond's marred face curdled into deeper purple, as if an unpardonable shadow had been cast upon his hour of self-congratulation. He said brusquely, I commissioned them from a fellow in my own service. You would not know his name, of a lane born, but he had some skill. With that he swept on, avoiding further question, and wife and men servants and maid trailed after him. Only the older groom, who seemed less in awe of his lord than anyone, perhaps by reason of his having so often presided over the ceremony of carrying him dead drunk to his bed, turned back for a moment to pluck at Brother Oswald's sleeve and advise him in a confidential whisper. You'll find him short to question on that head. The silversmith, Allard, his name was, cut and ran from his service last Christmas, and for all they hunted him as far as London, where the signs pointed, he's never been found. I let that matter lie if I were you. With that he trotted away after his master, and left several thoughtful faces staring after him. Not a man to part willingly with any property of his, mused Brother Cadfile, metal or man, but for a price, and a steep price at that. Brother, be ashamed, reproved Brother Jerome at his elbow. Has he not parted with these very treasures from pure charity? Catfile refrained from elaborating on the profit Fitzhammond expected for his benevolence. It was never worth arguing with Jerome, who in any case knew as well as anyone that the silver lilies and the rent of one farm were no free gift. But Brother Oswald said grievingly, I wish he had directed his charity better. Surely these are beautiful things, a delight to the eyes. But, well sold, they could have provided money enough to buy the means of keeping my poorest petitioners alive through the winter, some of whom will surely die for the want of them. Brother Jerome was scandalized. Has he not given them to Our Lady herself? He lamented indignantly. Beware of the sin of those apostles who cried out with the same complaint against the woman who brought the pot of spikenard and poured it over the Saviour's feet. Remember our Lord's reproof to them, that they should let her alone, for she had done well? Our Lord was acknowledging a well-meant impulse of devotion, said Brother Oswald with spirit. He did not say it was well advised. She hath done what she could, is what he said. He never said that with a little thought she might not have done better. What use would it have been to wound the giver after the thing was done? Spilled oil of spikenard could hardly be recovered. His eyes dwelt with love and compunction upon the silver lilies with their tall stems of wax and flame, for these remain, and to divert them to other use was still possible, or would have been possible if the donor had been a more approachable man. He had, after all, a right to dispose as he wished of his own property. It is sin, admonished Jerome sanctimoniously, even to covet for other use, however worthy, that which has been given to Our Lady. The very thought is sin. If Our Lady could make her own will known, said Brother Cadfile dryly, we might learn which is the graver sin, and which the more acceptable sacrifice. Could any price be too high for the lighting of this holy altar? demanded Jerome. It was a good question, Cadfile thought as they went to supper in the refractory. Ask Brother Jordan, for instance, the value of light. Jordan was old and frail, and gradually going blind. As yet he could distinguish shapes, but like shadows in a dream. Though he knew his way about cloisters and precincts so well, 
that his gathering darkness was no hindrance to his freedom of movement. But as every day the twilight closed in on him by a shade, so did his profound love of light grow daily more devoted, till he had forsaken other duties, and taken upon himself to tend all the lamps and candles on both altars, for the sake of being always irradiated by light and sacred light at that. As soon as Compline was over this evening, he would be busy devoutly trimming the wicks of candle and lamp, to have the steady flame smokeless and immaculate for the matins of Christmas Day. Doubtful if he would go to his bed at all until matins and lauds were over. The very old need little sleep, and sleep is itself a kind of darkness. But what Jordan treasured was the flame of light, and not the vessel holding it. Would not those splendid two-pound candles shine upon him just as well from plain wooden sconces? Cadfire was in the warming-house with the rest of the brothers, about a quarter of an hour before Compline, when a lay brother from the guest hall came inquiring for him. The lady asks if you'll speak with her. She is complaining of a bad head, and that she'll never be able to sleep. Brother Hospitaller recommended her to you for a remedy. Cadfile went with him without comment, but with some curiosity, for at Vespers the Lady Fitzhamon had looked in blooming health and sparkling spirits, nor did she seem greatly changed when he met her in the hall, though she was still swathed in the cloak she had worn to cross the great court to and from the abbot's house, and had the hood so drawn that it shattered her face. The silent maid hovered at her shoulder. "'You are Brother Cadfile?' They tell me you are an expert in herbs and medicines, and can certainly help me. I came back early from the Lord Abbot's supper with such a headache, and have told my Lord that I should go early to bed. But I have such disturbed sleep, and with this pain how shall I be able to rest? Can you give me some draught that will ease it? They say you have a perfect apothecarium in your herb garden, and all your own work, growing, gathering, drying, brewing, and all. There must be something there that can soothe pain and bring deep sleep. Well, thought Cadfile, small blame to her if she sometimes sought a means to ward off her old husband's rough attentions for a night, especially for a festival night when he was likely to have drunk heavily. Nor was it Cadfile's business to question whether the petitioner really needed his remedies. A guest might ask for whatever the house afforded. I have a syrup of my own making, he said which may do you good service. I'll bring you a vial of it from my workshop store. May I come with you? I should like to see your workshop. She had forgotten to sound frail and tired. The voice could have been a curious child's. As I am already cloaked and shod, she said winningly, We just returned from the Lord Abbot's table. But should you not go in from the cold, madam? Though the snow swept here in the court, it lies on some of the garden paths. A few minutes in the fresh air will help me, she said, before trying to sleep, and it cannot be far. It was not far. Once away from the subdued lights of the buildings, they were aware of the stars, snapping like sparks from a cold fire, and a clear black sky just engendering a few scattered snow clouds in the east. In the garden, between the pleached hedges, it seemed almost warm, as though the sleeping trees breathed tempered air as well as cutting off the bleak wind. The silence was profound. The herb garden was walled, and the wooden hut where Cadfile brewed and stored his medicines was sheltered from the worst of the cold. Once inside, and a small lamp kindled, Lady Fitzhammond forgot her invalid role in wonder and delight, looking round her with bright, inquisitive eyes. The maid, submissive and still, scarcely turned her head, but her eyes ranged from left to right, and a faint color touched life into her cheeks. The many faint sweet scents made her nostrils quiver, and her lips curved just perceptibly with pleasure. Curious as a cat, the lady probed into every sack and jar and box, peered at mortars and bottles, and asked a hundred questions in a breath. And this is rosemary, these little dried needles— and in this great sack is it grain. She plunged her hands wrist-deep inside the neck of it, and the hut was filled with sweetness. Lavender? Such great harvest of it. Do you then prepare perfumes for us women? 
Lavender has other good properties, said Cadfile. He was filling a small vial with a clear syrup he made from eastern poppies, a legacy of his crusading years. It is helpful for all disorders that trouble the head and spirit, and its scent is calming. I'll give you a little pillow filled with that and other herbs that shall help to bring you sleep, but this draft will ensure it. You may take all that I give you here and get no harm, only a good night's rest. She had been playing inquisitively with a pile of small clay dishes he kept by his workbench, rough dishes in which the fine seas sifted from fruiting plants could be spread to dry out. But she came at once to gaze eagerly at the modest vial he presented to her. Said, enough. It takes much to give me sleep. This, he assured her patiently, would bring sleep to a strong man. But it will not harm even a delicate lady like you. She took it in her hand with a small, sleek smile of satisfaction. Then I thank you indeed. I will make a gift, shall I, to your almoner in requital. Elf Giva, you bring the little pillow. I shall breathe it all night long. It should sweeten dreams. So her name was Elf Giva, a Norse name. She had Norse eyes, as he had already noted, blue as ice and pale, fine skin worn finer and whiter by weariness. All this time she had noted everything that passed, motionless, and never said word. Was she older or younger than her lady? There was no guessing. This one was so clamant, and the other so still. He put out his lamp and closed the door, and led them back to the great court, just in time to take leave of them, and still be prompt for Compline. Clearly the lady had no intention of attending. As for the lord, he was just being helped away from the abbot's lodging, his groom supporting him, one on either side, though as yet he was not gravely drunk. They headed for the guest hall at an easy roll. No doubt only the hour of Compline had concluded the drawn-out supper, probably to the abbot's considerable relief. He was no drinker, and could have very little in common with Hamo Fitzhamon apart, of course, from a deep devotion to the altar of St. Mary. The lady and her maid had already vanished within the guest hall. The younger groom carried in his free hand a large jug, full, to judge by the way he held it. The young wife could drain her draught and clutch her herbal pillow with confidence. The drink he was not yet at an end, and her sleep would be solitary and untroubled. Brother Catfile went to Compline mildly sad and obscurely comforted, only when service was ended, and the brothers on the way to their beds, did he remember that he left his flask of poppy syrup unstoppered. Not that it would come to any harm in the frosty night, but his sense of fitness drove him to go and remedy the omission before he slept. His sandaled feet, muffled in strips of woolen cloth for warmth and safety on the frozen paths, made his coming quite silent, and he was already reaching out a hand to the latch of the door, but not yet touching when he was brought up short and still by the murmur of voices within, soft, whispering, dreamy voices that made sounds less and more than speech, caresses rather than words, though once at least words surfaced for a moment, a man's voice, young, wary, sang, But what if he does? And a woman's soft, suppressed laughter, He'll sleep till morning, never fear. And her words were suddenly hushed with kissing and her laughter became huge, ecstatic sighs. The young man's breath heaving triumphantly, but still a moment later the note of fear again, half enjoyed, still you know him, he may, and she, soothing, not for an hour at least, then will go, it will grow cold here. That, at any rate, was true, small fear of them wishing to sleep out the night here. Even too close wrapped in the one cloak on the bench bed against the wooden wall, Brother Catfile withdrew very circumspectly from the herb garden and made his way back in chase and thought towards the dortoir. Now he knew who had swallowed that draught of his, and it was not the lady. In the pitcher of wine the young groom had been carrying? Enough for a strong man, even if he had not been drunk already. Meantime, no doubt, the body servant was left to put his lord to bed somewhere apart from the chamber where the lady lay supposedly nursing her indisposition and sleeping the sleep of the innocent. Ah, oh, well, it was no business of Catfile's, nor had he any intention of getting involved. 
he did not feel particularly censorious, doubtful if she ever had any choice about marrying Hamo, and with this handsome boy forever about them, to point the contrast. A brief experience of genuine passion, echoing old loves, pricked sharply through the years of his vocation. At least he knew what he was condoning, and who could help feeling some admiration for her opportunist daring, the quick wit that had procured the means, the alert eye that had seized on the most remote and adequate shelter available. Cadfile went to bed, and slept without dreams, and rose at the matin bell some minutes before midnight. The procession of the brothers wound its way down the night stairs into the church, and into the soft full glow of the lights before St. Mary's altar. Withdrawn reverently some yards from the step of the altar, old brother Jordan, who should long ago have been in his cell with the rest, kneeled upright with clasped hands and a static face in which the great veiled eyes stared full into the light he loved. When Prior Robert exclaimed in concern at finding him there on the stones and laid a hand on his shoulder, he started as if out of a trance and lifted to them a countenance itself all light. O oh, brothers, I have been so blessed, I have lived through a wonder. Praise God that ever it was granted to me. But bear with me, for I am forbidden to speak of it to any for three days. On the third day from today I may speak. Look, brothers, wailed Jerome, suddenly pointing. Look at the altar. Every man present except Jordan, who still serenely prayed and smiled, turned to gape where Jerome pointed. The tall candles stood secured by drops of their own wax in two small clay dishes, such as catfowl used, for sorting seeds. The two silver lilies were gone from the place of honor. Through loss, disorder, consternation, and suspicion, Prior Robert would still hold fast to the order of the day. Let Hamo Fitzhamon sleep in happy ignorance till morning. Still matins and lauds must be properly celebrated. Christmas was larger than all the giving and losing of silverware. Grimly he saw the services of the church observed, and dispatch the brethren back to their beds until prime, to sleep or lie wakeful and fearful as they might. Nor would he allow any pestering of Brother Jerome by others, though possibly he did try in private to extort something more satisfactory from the old man. Clearly the theft, whether he knew anything about it or not, Trouble Jordan not at all. To everything he said only, I am enjoined to silence until midnight of the third day. And when they asked by whom, he smiled seraphically and was silent. It was Robert himself who broke the news to Hamo Fitzhammond in the morning before Mass. The uproar, though vicious, was somewhat tempered by the after-effects of Cadfile's poppy draught, which dulled the edges of energy, if not of malice. His body servant, the older groom Sven, was keeping well back out of reach, even with Robert still present, and the lady sat somewhat apart too, as though still frail and possibly a little out of temper. She exclaimed dutifully, and apparently sincerely, at the outrage done to her husband, and echoed his demand that the thief should be hunted down, and the candlesticks recovered. Prior Robert was just as zealous in the matter, no effort should be spared to regain the princely gift, of that they could be sure. He had already made certain of various circumstances which should limit the hunt. There had been a brief fall of snow after Compline, just enough to lay down a clean film of white on the ground. No single footprint had as yet marked this pure layer. He had only to look for himself at the paths leading from both parish doors of the church to see that no one had left by that way. The porter would swear that no one had passed the gatehouse, and on the one side of the abbey grounds not walled, the Mayo Brook was full and frozen, but the snow on both sides of it was virgin. Within the enclave, of course, tracks and cross-tracks were trodden out everywhere, but no one had left the enclave since Compline, when the candlesticks were still in their place. So the miscreant is still within the walls, said Hamo, glinting vengefully. So much the better. Then his booty is still here within, too, and if we have to turn all your abode doors out of dortoirs, we'll find it, it and him. We will search everywhere, agreed Robert, and question every man. We are as deeply offended as your lordship at this blasphemous crime. You may yourself oversee the search, if you will. 
So all that Christmas day, alongside the solemn rejoicings in the church, an angry hunt raged about the precincts in full cry. It was not difficult for all the monks to account for their time to the last minute, their routine being so ordered that brother inevitably extricated brother from suspicion and such as had special duties that took them out of the general view, like Cadfile and his visit to the herb garden, had all witnesses to vouch for them. The lay brothers ranged more freely, but tended to work in pairs, at least. The servants and the few guests protested their innocence, and if they had not, all of them, others willing to prove it, neither could Hamo prove the contrary. When he came to his own two grooms, there were several witnesses to testify that Sven had returned to his bed in the lofts of the stables as soon as he put his lord to bed, and certainly empty-handed. And Sven, as Catfile noted with interest, swore unblinkingly that young Matta, who had come in an hour after him, had nonetheless returned with him and spent that hour, at Sven's order, tending one of the pack-ponies, which showed signs of a cough, and that otherwise they had been together throughout of Elaine instinctively closing ranks with his kind against his lord, wondered Cadfile, but does Sven know very well where the young man was last night, or at least what he was about, and is he intent on protecting him from a worse vengeance? No wonder Mattock looked a shade less merry and rutty than usual this morning, though on the whole he kept his countenance very well, and refrained from even looking at the lady, while her tone to him was cool, sharp, and distant. Cadfile left them hard at it again after the miserable meal they made of dinner, and went into the church alone. While they were feverishly searching every corner for the candlesticks, he had forborne from taking part, but now they were elsewhere he might find something of interest there. He would not be looking for anything so obvious as two large silver candlesticks. He made obeisance at the altar, and mounted the step to look closely at the burning candles. No one had paid any attention to the modest containers that had been substituted for Hamo's gift, and just as well, in the circumstances, that Cadfile's workshop was very little visited, or these little clay pots might have been recognized as coming from there. He molded and baked them himself as he wanted them. He had no intention of condoning theft, but neither did he relish the idea of any creature, however sinful, falling into Hamo Fitzhammond's mercies. Something long and fine, a thread of silver gold was caught and coiled in the wax at the base of one candle. Carefully he detached candle from holder, and unlaced from it a long pale hair. To make sure of retaining it, he broke off the imprisoning disk of wax with it, and then hoisted it and turned the candle to see if anything else was to be found under it. One tiny oval dot showed. With a fingernail he extracted a single seed of lavender. Left in the dish from before time, he thought not. The stack pots were all empty. No, this had been brought here in the fold of a sleeve, most probably, and shaken out while the candle was being transferred. The lady had plunged both hands with pleasure into the sack of lavender, and moved freely about his workshop investigating everything. It would have been easy to take two of these dishes unseen, and wrap them in a fold of her cloak even more plausible, she might have delegated the task to young Maddock when they crept away from their assignation. Supposing, say, they had reached the desperate point of planning flight together, and needed funds to set them on their way to some safe refuge. Yes, there were possibilities. In the meantime, the grain of lavender had given Cadfile another idea, and there was, of course, that long, fine hair, pale as flax, but brighter. The boy was fair, but so fair? He went out through the frozen garden to his herbarium, shut himself securely into his workshop, and opened the sack of lavender, plunging both arms to the elbow, and groping through the chill, smooth sweetness that parted and slid like grain. They were there, well down. His fingers traced the shape first of one, then a second. He sat down to consider what must be done. Finding the lost valuables did not identify the thief. He could produce and restore them at once, but Fitzhammond would certainly pursue the hunt vindictively until he found the culprit, and Cadfile had seen enough of him to know that it might cost life and all before this complainant was satisfied. He needed to know more before he would hand over any man to be done to death. 
Better not leave the things here, however. He doubted if they would ransack his hut, but they might. He rolled the candlesticks in a piece of sacking and thrust them into the center of a pleached hedge where it was thickest. The meager frozen snow had dropped with a brief sun. His arm went into the shoulder, and when it withdrew, the twig sprang back and covered all, holding the package securely. Whoever had first hidden it would surely come by night to reclaim it and show a human face at last. It was well that he had moved it, for the searchers, driven by an increasingly angry hamo, reached his hut before Vespers, examined everything within it, while he stood by to prevent actual damage to his medicines, and went away satisfied that what they were seeking was not there. They had not, in fact, been very thorough about the sack of lavender. The candlesticks might well have escaped noticed even if he had left them there did not occur to anyone to tear the hedges apart, luckily. When they were gone, to probe all the fodder and grain in the barns, Catfile restored the silver to its original place. Let the bait lie safe in the trap until the quarry came to claim it, as he surely would, once relieved of the fear that the hunters might find it first. Catfile kept watch that night. He had no difficulty in absenting himself from the dortoir, once everyone was in bed and asleep. His cell was by the night stairs, and the prior slept at the far end of the long room and slept deeply. And bitter though the night air was, the sheltered hut was barely colder than his cell, and he kept blankets there for swathing some of his jars and bottles against frost. He took his little box with tinder and flint and hid himself in the corner behind the door. It might be a wasted vigil, the thief having survived one day, might think it politic to venture yet another before removing his spoils but it was not wasted. He reckoned it might be as late as ten o'clock when he heard a light hand at the door, two hours before the bell would sound for matins, almost two hours since the household had retired. Even the guest hall should be silent and asleep by now. The hour was carefully chosen. Cadfile held his breath and waited. The door swung open. A shadow stole past him. Light steps felt their way unerringly to where the sack of lavender was propped against the wall. Equally silently, Cadfile swung the door to again, and set his back against it. Only then did he strike a spark, and hold the blown flame to the wick of his little lamp. She did not start or cry out, or try to rush past him and escape into the night. The attempt would not have succeeded, and she had had long practice in enduring what could not be endured. She stood facing him as the small flame steadied and burned taller, her face shadowed by the hood of her cloak the candlesticks clasped possessively to her breast. Elf Giva, said Brother Catfile gently, and then, are you here for yourself or for your mistress? But he thought he knew the answer already. That frivolous young wife would never really leave her rich husband an easy life, however tedious and unpleasant Hamo's attentions might be, to risk everything with her penniless villain lover. She would only keep him to enjoy in secret whenever she felt it safe. Even when the old man died, she would submit to marriage at an overlord's will to another equally distasteful. She was not the stuff of which heroines and adventurers are made. This was another kind of woman. Cadfile went close and lifted a hand gently to put back the hood from her head. She was tall, a hand's breadth taller than he, and erect as one of the lilies she clasped. The net that had covered her hair was drawn off with a hood, and a great flood of silver gold streamed about her in the dim light, framing the pale face and startling blue eyes. Norse hair. The Danes had left their seat as far south as Cheshire, and planted this tall flower among them. She was no longer plain, tired, and resigned. In this dim but loving light she shone in austere beauty. Just so must Brother Jordan's veiled eyes have seen her. Now I see, said Cadfile, you came into the Lady Chapel, and shone upon our half-blind brother's darkness as you shine here. You are the visitation that brought him awe and bliss, and enjoined silence upon him for three days. The voice he had scarcely heard speak a word until then, a voice level, low, and beautiful, said, I made no claim to be what I am not. It was he who mistook me. I did not refuse the gift. I understand. You had not thought to find anyone there. 
He took you by surprise as you took him. He took you for Our Lady herself, disposing, as she saw fit, of what had been given her. And you made him promise you three days' grace. The lady had plunged her hands into the sack, yes, but al Gifa had carried the pillow, and a grain or two had filtered through the muslin to betray her. Yes, she said, watching him with unwavering blue eyes. So in the end you had nothing against him making known how the candlesticks were stolen? It was not an accusation. He was pursuing his way to understanding. But at once she said clearly, I did not steal them. I took them. I will restore them to their owner. Then you don't claim they are yours. No, she said, they are not mine, but neither are they Fitz Hammond's. Do you tell me, said Catfile mildly, that there has been no theft at all? Oh, yes, said Elfgiva, and her pallor burned into a fierce brightness, and her voice vibrated like a harp string. Yes, there has been a theft, and a vile, cruel theft, too, but not here, not now. The theft was a year ago, when Fitz Hammond removed these candlesticks from Alhard, who made them, his villain, like me. Do you know what the promised price was for these? Manumission for Alhard, and marriage with me, what we had begged of him three years and more. Even in Villainage, we would have married and been thankful, but he promised freedom. Free man makes free wife, and I was promised too. But when he got the fine works he wanted, then he refused the promised price. He laughed. I saw. I heard him. He kicked Alhard away from him, like a dog. So, what was his due, and denied him, Alhard took. He ran. On St. Stephen's Day he ran and left you behind, said Catfile gently. What chance had he to take me, or even to bid me farewell? He was thrust out to manual labor on Fitzhammond's other manor. When his chance came, he took it and fled. I was not sad. I rejoiced. Whether I live or die, whether he remembers or forgets me, he is free. No, but in two days more he will be free. For a year and a day he will have been working for his living in his own craft, in a charter borough, and after that he cannot be hailed back into servitude, even if they find him. I do not think, said Brother Cadfile, that he will have forgotten you. Now I see why our brother may speak after three days. It will be too late, then, to try to reclaim a runaway serf. And you behold that these exquisite things you were cradling belong by right to Allard, who made them? Surely, she said, seeing he never was paid for them, they are still his. And you were setting out tonight to take them to him. Yes, as I heard it, they had had some cause to pursue him towards London. Indeed, into London, though they never found him. Have you had better word of him? From him? The pale face smiled. Neither he nor I can read or write. And whom should we trust to carry word until his time is complete and he is free? No, never any word. But Shrewsbury is also a charter borough, where the unfree may work their way to freedom in a year and a day, and sensible boroughs encourage the coming of good craftsmen, and will go far to hide and protect them, I know. So you think he may be here, in the trail towards London, a false trail? True, why should he run so far when there's help so near? But, daughter, what if you do not find him in Shrewsbury? Then I will look for him elsewhere until I do. I can live as a runaway, too. I have skills. I can make my own way until I do get word of him. Shrewsbury can as well make room for a good seamstress as for a man's gifts, and someone in the silversmith's craft will know where to find a brother so talented as Allard. I shall find him. And when you do, O oh child, have you looked beyond that? To the very end, said el Kifa firmly, if I find him and he no longer wants me, no longer thinks of me, if he is married and has put me out of his mind, then I will deliver him these things that belong to him, to do with as he pleases, and go on my own way, and make my own life as best as I may without him, and wish well to him as long as I live. Oh no, small fear, she would not be easily forgotten, not in a year, not in many years. And if he is utterly glad of you, and loves you still, then, she said gravely, smiling, if he is of the same mind as I, I have made a vow to Our Lady, who lent me her semblance in the old man's eyes, 
that we will sell these candlesticks where they may fetch their proper price, and that price shall be delivered to your almoner to feed the hungry. And that will be our gift, Allard's and mine, though no one will ever know it. Our lady will know it, said Catfile, and so shall I. Now, how are you planning to get out of this enclave and into Shrewsbury? Both our gates and the town gates are closed until morning. She lifted eloquent shoulders. The parish doors are not barred, and even if I leave tracks, will it matter, provided I find safe hiding place inside the town? And wait in the cold of the night? You would freeze before morning. No, let me think. We can do better for you than that. Her lips shaped. We, in silence, wondering but quick to understand, she did not question his decisions, as he had not questioned hers. He thought he would long remember the slow, deepening smile, the glow of warmth mantling her cheeks. You believe me, she said. Every word. Here, give me the candlesticks. Let me wrap them. And do you put up your hair again in net and hood? We've had no fresh snow since morning. The path to the parish door is well trodden. No one will know your tracks among the many. And, girl, when you come to the town end of the bridge, there's a little house off to the left, under the wall close to the town gate. Knock there and ask for shelter over the night till the gates open, and say that Brother Cadfall sent you. They know me. I doctored their son when he was sick. They'll give you a warm corner and a place to lie for kindness' sake, and ask no questions, and answer none from others either, and likely they'll know where to find the silversmiths of the town to set you on your way. She bound up her pale bright hair and covered her head, wrapping the cloak about her, and was again the maid-servant in homespun. She obeyed without question his every word, moved silently at his back round the great court by way of the shadows, halting when he halted, and so he brought her to the church and led her out by the parish door into the public street, still a good hour before matins. At the last moment, she said, close at his shoulder within the half-open door, I shall be grateful always. Some day I shall send you word. No need for words, said Brother Cadfile. You send me the sign, I shall be waiting for it. Go now, quickly. There's not a soul stirring. She was gone, lightly and silently, flitting past the abbey gatehouse like a tall shadow, towards the bridge in the town. Cadfile closed the door softly, and went back up the night stairs to the dortoir. Too late to sleep, but in good time to rise at the sound of the bell and return in procession to celebrate matins. There was, of course, the resultant uproar to face next morning, and he could not afford to avoid it. There was too much at stake. Lady Fitzhammon naturally expected her maid to be in attendance as soon as she opened her eyes, and raised a petulant outcry when there was no submissive shadow waiting to dress her and do her hair. Calling failed to summon and search to find Elfgiva, but it was an hour or more before it dawned on the lady that she had lost her accomplished maid for good. Furiously she made her own toilet, unassisted, and raged out to complain to her husband, who had risen before her, and was waiting for her to accompany him to Mass. At her angry declaration that Elf Giva was nowhere to be found, and must have run away during the night, he first scoffed, for why should a sane girl take herself off into a killing frost when she had warmth and shelter? and enough to eat where she was. Then he made the inevitable connection, and let out a roar of rage. Gone is she, and my candlesticks gone with her, I dare swear. So it was she, the foul little thief, but I'll have her yet, I'll drag her back. She shall not live to enjoy her ill-gotten gains. It seemed likely that the lady would heartily endorse all this. Her mouth was already open to echo him, when Brother Cadfile, brushing her sleeve close as the agitated brothers ringed the pair, contrived to shake a few grains of lavender on to her wrist. Her mouth closed abruptly. She gazed at the tiny things for the briefest instant before she took them off. She flashed an even briefer glance at Brother Cadfile, caught his eye, and heard in a rapid whisper, Madam, softly, proof of the maid's innocence is also proof of the mistress's. She was by no means a stupid woman. A second quick glance confirmed what she had already grasped, that there was one man here who had a weapon to hold over her 
as deadly as any she could use against El Giva. She was also a woman of decision, and wasted no time in bitterness once her course was chosen. The tone in which she addressed her lord was almost as sharp as that in which she had complained of El Giva's desertion. She, your thief, indeed. That's folly, as you should very well know. The girl is an ungrateful fool to leave me, but a thief she never has been, and certainly is not this time. She can't possibly have taken the candlesticks. You know well enough when they vanished, and you know I was not well that night and went early to bed. She was with me until long after Brother Pryor discovered the theft. I asked her to stay with me until you came to bed. As you never did, she ended tartly. You may remember. Hamo probably remembered very little of that night. Certainly he was in no position to gainsay what his wife so roundly declared. He took out a little of his ill temper on her, but she was not so much in awe of him that she dared not reply in kind. Of course she was certain of what she said. She had not drunk herself stupid at the Lord Abbot's table. She had been nursing a bad head of another kind and even with Brother Cadfile's remedies she had not slept until after midnight, and Elf Giva had then been still beside her. Let him hunt a runaway maidservant, by all means, the thankless hussy, but never call her a thief, for she was none. Hunt her he did, though with less energy now it seemed clear he would not recapture his property with her. He sent his grooms and half the lay servants, off in both directions to inquire if anyone had seen a solitary girl in a hurry. They were kept at it all day, but they returned empty-handed. The party from Lydiat, less one member, left for home next day. Lady Fitzhammond rode demurely behind young Mattock, her cheek against his broad shoulders. She even gave Brother Cadfile the flicker of a conspiratorial smile as the cavalcade rode out of the gates and detached one arm from round Mattock's waist wave as they reached the roadway. So Hamo was not present to hear when Brother Jordan, at last released from his vow, told how Our Lady had appeared to him in a vision of light, fair as an angel, and taken away with her the candlesticks that were hers to take and do with as she would, and how she had spoken to him and enjoined on him his three days of silence. And if there were some among the listeners who wondered whether the fair woman had not been a more corporeal being, no one had the heart to say so to Jordan, whose vision was comfort and consolation for the fading of the light. That was at Matins, at midnight of the day of St. Stephen's. Among the scattering of alms handed in at the gatehouse next morning for the beggars, there was a little basket that weighed surprisingly heavily. The porter could not remember who had brought it, taking it to be some offerings of food or old clothing, like all the rest. But when it was opened, it sent Brother Oswald, almost incoherent with joy and wonder, running to Abbot Herebert to report what seemed to be a miracle, for the basket was full of gold coin, to the value of more than a hundred marks. Well used, it would ease all the worst needs of his poorest petitioners, until the weather relented. Surely, said Brother Oswald, devoutly, Our Lady has made her own will known. Is not this the sign we have hoped for? Certainly it was for Cadfile, and earlier than he had dared to hope for it. He had the message that needed no words. She had found him, and been welcomed with joy. Since midnight, Allard the silversmith had been a free man, a free man makes free wife. Present it with such a woman as Elf Giva, he could give as gladly as she, for what was gold, what was silver, by comparison. End of The Price of Light by Ellis Peters